So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of like the beginning of this work. Um, so as was mentioned, um, it started off as a dissertation, um, which I published in 2006. Um, it was called at the time, uh, Truth as Relationship, the Psychology oh, of Graham Howe. Um, but originally, um, I intended on writing my dissertation on Aleister Crowley. Um, and so I was setting out to do an actual psychobiography on him. And um, I started to create a draft, uh, which would be my dissertation proposal. And um, needless to say, it was quickly rejected. Um, it was, it, was, uh, it was something that I had a hard time getting a dissertation director to actually direct um, and even a committee uh, that would actually form around that. And so um, I went to my uh, dissertation director and I kind of asked him, I said, you know, um, I want to do something on um, either psychobiography um, or the interface between psychotherapy and spirituality. And I thought, well, what about Alan Watts? Um, maybe look at his work in relation to um, psychoanalysis and depth psychology. And um, he's like, oh no, that's that's already been done. And he goes, well, have you ever heard of Eric Graham Howe? And um, I said, Eric Graham who? And so that's kind of become the running joke. Um, when I ask people if they have ever heard of E. Graham Howe, they say who? So it's almost like E. Graham who? Um, so I never heard of him. and. Um, Dr. Daniel Burston, my dissertation director, proceeded to tell me about him a little bit. And, um, you know, as I mentioned um, in the introduction of the book, um, Eric Graham Howe, um, you know, a 20th century um, British psychiatrist, um, influenced the likes of R.D. Lang, um, Alan Watts, Henry Miller, uh, one of the founding members of the Tavistock Clinic. Um, entered into a really, really cool uh, dialogue with Carl Jung in 1935 um, when Jung came and, and presented and um, attempted to differentiate um, his own system from Freud's and Adler's. And that whole discussion between um, Howe and, and Jung is actually a chapter in uh, A Druid in Psychologist's Clothing um, called Time and the Unconscious, right? Is there a fourth dimension? Um, so I began to wonder, like, you know, how, how is this man, um, how was he neglected and kind of ignored um, by the history of psychoanalysis, um, by the history of psychotherapy, um, the history of spirituality? And so I sought to look into that a little bit more um, and kind of come up with some of those answers. And then the important part of the dissertation was sort of to rewrite him into the history of psychoanalysis, um, in particular using Dr. Daniel Burston's um, typology of psychoanalytic theorists. And so I situated how in relation to Freud um, in what would be called the dissident fringe group that would also include people like Jung. Um, and so with this particular talk though, um, I'll probably focus less on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and kind of look more into Howe's druidry, right? And sort of the druid druidic threads that run throughout his work. Um, and so in looking at that, you know, I thought of, you know, key passages from the book itself that I'd really like to go over with everyone here um, and then end with some readings from Howe's posthumously published book called uh, The Mind of the Druid, um, published by Scoob Books, um, who, as many of you know, published uh, the works of Kenneth Grant. Um, and so I'm going to take a look at that, and that will kind of serve as a conclusion of uh, this particular webinar. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is begin with an actual quote from The Mind of a Druid. And um, one of my favorite quotes and um, it has to do with um, how's kind of take on magic and what it meant to be a druid. And he writes, to be a druid, 
was to be a master in the art of living. They practiced magic, yet were not magicians within the deteriorated meaning of that word today. To be conservation and control of energy with the continuum required that they should be masters of the craft of life. And within the continuum, for those who knew its laws, magic was no more than a prime sort of common sense. So this kind of thread, you know, runs throughout Howe's writings and it runs throughout his psychology. And in many ways, um, the actual book is a, a meditation or a kind of commentary on this one passage, believe it or not. Um, you know, and so what I'll do is I'll kind of unpack this in different ways. Um, so the name of this this webinar I'm calling the Zen Druidry of E. Graham Howe, and you'll and you'll see why. Like I put the word Zen in front of Druidry as we go throughout this talk. Um, so kind of looking at how you know, born in 1897, died in 1975, um, influenced all of these people. Um, was a friend of Krishnamurti, D. T. D. T. Suzuki. Um, you know, was an eclectic, um, dabbled in all sorts of spiritual and philosophical practices. Um, because he was ignored and kind of left out of the history, I felt that it was necessary to write a comprehensive survey of his work um, that would demonstrate like the, the profundity of his thought and kind of address sort of this ambivalent relationship that he had with the works of Freud, Jung, and their followers. Um, and I wanted to show like his relationship to existential phenomenology, um, Asian philosophy, and also Western esotericism, um, namely, of course, uh, Druid, Druidry. Um, so how use these different traditions to kind of elucidate um, uh, his ambivalence as well as critique of uh, this doctrinaire approach that many analytically oriented psychotherapists had in his day. Um, and so what he did was he took this very spirit of his ambivalence and it moved him toward this profound exploration of the human psyche. Um, and like with Jung, it was this exploration that often led him outside of the realms of psychoanalysis and psychology. Um, so his his clinical insights and how was first and foremost a healer a clinician um he derived them from psychoanalysis phenomenology um, existentialism um asian philosophy and in the words of rd lang um, express that which all schools seeks to seek to express so how used the imagery and language of each of those traditions to point to the art of healing in them all um, he was not an author of like Zen Buddhist, uh, Vedantic, esoteric, um, or philosophical texts, but he infused the spirit of, of each of those within his own psychology. And so if you read his work, you can discover these traditions as traces that run throughout his psychology. Um, and what this means is that you can't really find them in these overt forms um, and because of that, um, his work really can't be systematized, especially at that time, um, or looked at from the perspective of a given system. And I think that's why, in part, it was so hard to categorize him at that time and to situate him within the psychoanalytic tradition. Um, so he was profoundly anti-systematic, um, and he felt like each of the traditions, um, based on my reading, could only approximate the spirit that each actually expressed. Um, at most, when you're looking at these traditions, um, they're a language of symbols, right? Where, where each symbol, right, served as a vehicle for a kind of noumenon. And when you bring them all together, were like noumena that signified what really couldn't be represented and that which actually exceeded representation. Um, there were, were times, though, throughout Howe's writings that he used jargon, um, but he didn't do it in a technical kind of sense that would align him with a given system. He always sought to transgress and kind of transcend jargon. Um, and in turn, like he would he would 
he would transgress and transcend um, systematic approaches to psychology, philosophy, uh, religion, the spiritual systems. Um, and my reading of his work shows that there was this kind of margin or even outside to the way jargon was used within the traditions. Um, and there were these meanings that were abject in some way um, to those that wanted to systematize. So there were these reimagined meanings that came from within the terms, the jargon themselves. And, you know, he kind of, with his simplicity in a way, he pushes them to their limits. Um, so in a way that they, they collapse and give way to new meanings. And sometimes even restoring terms to their, their original primary sources. Um, conventional words um, were signifiers and could be reimagined and appropriated in these different creative, innovative ways. Um, so he looked at all of these traditions, right? Uh, philosophical, analytic, spiritual, and he was trying to show that in some way they were pointing to a common source, this mysterious other to which all of them referred, right? So it is this energy or feeling, um, intuition that inspires, and how throughout his works was, especially in the mind of the Druid, um, he would use the term that, and he would capitalize it, capital T-H-T, and this was this name um, in some way for this mysterious other, you know, which breathes spirit into being, um, but it's not any individual being. Um, it is nameless. Um, it can take any form and can be expressed through any form. And as many of you might know, the Druids actually have uh, a term for this, um, this kind of nameless name for this mysterious other. Um, they call it Awen, right? And um, I'm going to read um, a definition from John Michael Greer. What he writes is, uh, Awen is greater than the galaxies. This same principle is at one and the same moment present to each individual being within the universe as a source for inspiration and insight. And furthermore, it cannot be represented adequately by words or symbols. Its name and the emblem of the three rays of light are concessions to the human inability to grasp the transcendent without name and form. Um, so Awan is not being, it's not non-being, but as Howe would say that, which connects being with non-being, causing being to come from non-being, creating out of nothing, but is not itself nothing. Um, and as the source of inspiration, it's kind of like this groundless ground of being. Um, is it God? Well, probably not, but that which is beyond God, um, that which is of the infinite order, um, that, that which takes us beyond the word itself, um, it's comparable to the Tao and Taoism, uh, Kia and Austin Osman Spare's philosophy. Um, it's this other without naming it in such a way that can kind of constrict its meaning and giving, through, giving it through many names and guises and presentations and forms. It's kind of what I would call this meta trace um, that runs through how psychology and can also be found in the way he kind of takes up and appropriates different traditions. So if you look at his psychology as a whole, it's a psychology that's really infused with Alwyn. So Lang in his uh, foreword to How's Cure or Heal um, that was mentioned at the very beginning um, writes that How's writing is both Zen and existential, which it certainly is. But what that also implies is that his Druidry was also Zen and existential. Um, this suggests that his psychology is druidic in nature, even though um, when you read Howe's works, he would probably reject that label, um, and yet all labels for that matter. Um, so the terms like druid, druidry, or druidic, um, especially in the way Howe uses them, kind of apply to his thinking as a whole. Um, so if we call his druidry either Zen or existential, it applies that his psychology is alive, it's creative, uh, spontaneous, awakened to the now, awakened to that. It's organic, it's dynamic, it's fluid. And it's, it's less about like druidic rites and ceremonies 
and more about the mind of the Druid, which again is this name of um, this posthumously published collection of spiritual aphorisms and reflections. So uh, for me, what Howe would have us do is put on the mind of the Druid and experience the world, experience self, experience nature, experience the other in that way, just as, as St. Paul would have us put on the mind of Christ, right? So what Howe would seem to be interested in was a kind of Druidry that was more a way of being in the world, uh, to use a Heideggerian term. Um, it was a way of living, a means of taking up self, other, and world. Um, for him, Druidry seemed to be a way of evoking life in a, a psychological landscape that had become void of spirituality, of experiencing spirit and nature, and with Awen or the source being the very uh, foundation for his approach to healing, making it metaphysical in some way. So there is this like Druidic grammatology that is that is woven throughout his writings, just as in many ways there's this Gnostic one that you can find in Jung's. And so I kind of look at how's the mind of the Druid in a way that's comparable to, to Jung's The Red Book and that they both serve a similar type of purpose. Um, there are both these kind of like uh, posthumous publications and in some way present sort of the, the essence or the esoteric uh, side of uh, each man's psychology, right? And so you could look at Jung's collected works, for instance, as a way for him to try to explain um, the meaning of the Red Book and what that was all about. And you could look at, in some way, uh, how psychological writings um, as this way of trying to kind of explain or translate um, the mind of the Druid. Even though he didn't necessarily say that, you could certainly take it up in that way. Um, so when you look at the mind of the Druid in the Red Book, it's you kind of see um, how in Jung's um, encounter with the unconscious, right, both the individual and the collective unconscious, um, the language that gets used reflects experiences that are direct, showing kind of this fearlessness with which uh, Howe and Jung uh, took up their subjects as these encounters with the numinous that transformed both of them. Um, so you can see this, this Gnosticism kind of being ever present in Jung, um, just as Howe's Druidry was for him. And so within how psychology, there is this like secret Druidic doctrine. Um, this is comparable in some ways um, to H.P. Blavatsky, who showed that there was a secret occult doctrine found in all of the religious traditions, uh, both Occidental and Oriental, as well as the, the philosophical traditions at, the, at that time um, and, and prior to that, of course, and not to mention like science and cosmology. Um, so you can look at her, her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, as a way to reveal this occult trace in religion, philosophy, and science. Um, so Howe used his psychology to point to his unique expression of Druidry um, without always naming it. So the task of my book um, is, is to really show how Howe uses the language of psychology, of psychoanalysis, to kind of point to or allude to this doctrine using the language of analysis, philosophy, and the spiritual traditions to show that there's kind of this um, Druidic spirit in a way, the way I read it. Um, so within Howe's creative expression of Druidry, um, and you really see this in his uh, more posthumously published work. Um, so what we have to do here is kind of reframe you know, um, Howe's use of these signifiers, um, Druid and Druidry, and how for him, like Druidry kind of transcends the tradition itself, um, just like, you know, essential psychology transcends psychology, philosophy goes beyond philosophy, and spirituality goes beyond spirituality. So if you look at the book as a whole, each chapter in the book is kind of an article of clothing um, focusing on, in some ways, a different aspect of what I have called how Zen Druidry, but as presented um, as a part of his new uh, science of psychology. Um, so when you situate how in relation to psychoanalysis, 
looking at his understanding of depression, love, war, and his secret druidic do doctrine kind of being revealed throughout that, psychology is sort of this exoteric side in relation to druidry, which is this esoteric side of his work. So sometimes the, the article of clothing uh, serves as a veil, and I try to lift that, and sometimes it's not, with the psychology at times being allowed to stand on its own. So when lifted, Howe's druidry will show itself through his psychology, as well as his use of philosophy and spirituality. And, but there are other times um, that Howe's uh, clothing does not conceal his druidry, and that you can really see in uh, the posthumously published Mind of the Druid, and I'll read passages from that toward the end, um, but directly kind of represents or signifies it. Um, so for me, I tried to follow um, the, this very spirit of house Druidry, the Zen Druidry um, that I'm calling it here, um, and kind of drawing um, inspiration from the source of wisdom itself, um, Awen, right? kind of being receptive as I, I was writing, revising it um, to moments of inspiration in my encounter, as my own dialogue with Hal uh, speaks through the pages of the book. And, you know, the, the part that I'm going to reference now was that kind of came to me during a moment of inspiration. So I'm just going to kind of read that directly. Um, so it goes on to say, um, this charted a pathless pass path through a philosophy that is timeless, as that ever-present beginningless beginning that intuits the nothingness at the heart of primordial being, as that sacred raven that circumnavigates the tree of life, the holy Yggdrasil, upon which the All-Father, the one-eyed seer, sacrificed himself for the sake of himself, so that the eye lost could be the eye gained the eye of knowledge beyond knowledge, non-knowledge as an illumination of the infinite order where becoming knows no bounds, only meeting its self-limitation as the rising and falling of the plethora of worlds and the 10,000 things that inhabit those worlds, all donning the masks of Awan, effortless, effortlessly breathing Nuvra as the one life in all lives, the formless that transgresses and transcends the name of God. So that came to me, you know, during a moment of inspiration. Um, so kind of moving moving forward um, in this idea of Zen Druidry, uh, God is that which has no name. It's this that which even transcends naming, inscribing the nameless as this uncaused cause um, the source of the sacred word, um, this this idea of self um, or divinity being infused in nature, um, which is all kind of submerged in the druid's own psyche, um, where they can act from the subconscious part, um, you know, in a way um, emanating, you know, phenomena and um, kind of translating the sensory perceptual world um, through the divine's way of dispersing itself. And so, when we look at how he was, he was no doubt for me a, a druid, right? Uh, but he was this druid in psychologist clothing, um, kind of happily playing the role of this of a psychiatrist um, whose focus it was primarily to heal, like he was a healer through and through. Um, he was in a way this anathematized psychologist, the way I take him up, um, and kind of estranged um, from this profession, psychiatry, psychology, um, that made these domain claims um, upon uh, a goddess, a deity, right? Psyche, which is where we get psychiatry, where we get psychology from. Um, this, this goddess um, that psychologists and psychiatrists claim to know, um, but knew her not, um, which is to say that they preferred knowledge of psyche that was at a distance um, less intimate, uh, less imminent knowledge, um, as opposed to being, as opposed to communing with and being inspired by this goddess through their work. So many psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, psychoanalysts of Hal's time, and even to this day, um, in my my feeling as a as a psychologist and a psychotherapist, 
um, betray psyche for what they're what they're calling science. Um, this amounts to um, not so much science, um, but to a kind of scientism, um, which in a way kind of strips the goddess of her divinity, um, which is the basis for healing power um, that comes from and through her. So a psychotherapy um, or a soul healing that is derived from um, a divineless kind of divinity, a, may, a divinity that's been actually made um, void by its servants, by psychiatrists, psychiatrists, social workers um, that purport to bring solace or, or peace to a wounded mind, only turn psychotherapy into a system. So what now passes as a form of psychotherapy itself oftentimes is a, is a repetition of this event that actually strips psyche of her divinity. So through this ritual of, uh, of curing, right? And so, and so in cure or heal, um, how makes this distinction between cure and heal, whereas psychotherapy for him is more about healing. And so in this attempt to cure, there's this ritual of de-divinizing psyche, um, which is not a form of healing the soul. Rather, it's what I call like this inspection of a, of a gaping wound um, where both therapist and client uh, look into this, this abyss, this uh, space where, where the heart of psyche, where the soul of psyche once was, um, this place where Nura was once summoned um, in its own way, only to see, I say, in a mirror as if you're looking at with faces with no eyes and sockets that stare into an abyss. So when you look at how his druidry, his druidic psychology, which wears the clothing of psychotherapy, um, you know, the symptom itself, um, the place where where Awen was was acknowledged as this metaphysical, and you can whether it's Awen or some other name. Um, as this metaphysical foundation for healing actually works through the abyss as a means to breathe life into it, uh, to inspire it, to restore psyche's divinity by invoking these spirits that vacated um, the psychiatric, psychological, and psychoanalytic traditions. Um, this druid in psychologist's clothing is not a wolf, right? Like the one who wears sheep's clothing, um, disguising itself as innocence, um, only to be this ravenous predator. Um, How was certainly a master of disguise, um, and he wears his druidry um, in these presentable forms, right? Forms that can be presentable um, as articles for academics, psychologists, psychoanalysts, philosophers, um, even for people outside of those traditions, because his writing is so simple. Um, but still profound nevertheless. Um, so you can look at his clothing um, that, his, that the Druidry wears and actually be drawn to it. So when, if you read um, his work as a psychologist or as an analyst, as a philosopher, you're actually drawn to something in the work that's not always expressing itself. And that's really what happened to me during my first run through his work. Um, so when you look at the book as a whole, it's really a way to explore um, how psychological clothing, um, for the sake of entering more deeply into his Zen Druidry, um, this Druidry that, you know, doesn't always adhere to the letter of uh, traditional Druidic lore, um, but to its very spirit, um, which connected it to the source and the spirit of other non-Druidic traditions, uh, Vedanta, Buddhism, uh, mystical Christianity, a uh, druidry that has been said repeatedly that is existential in Zen, um, one that articulated uh, perennial philosophy. So he never writes about druidry from the perspective of being distant from the ideas that he's expressing, but kind of becomes the druid and the ideas themselves, and therefore, in my opinion, constructs this kind of participatory uh, epistemology. So kind of like a, a Sufi, you know, who is seemingly a person of the world, immersed in worldly things and with worldly responsibility, um, how invites us to a druidry that is not separate from the world, which not, was not to say that it is, 
but his is one that is deeply engaged in it, um, contemplating nature, contemplating the logos, contemplating psychotherapy, looking at all of the different traditions as different forms of healing the soul. So now what I want to do is, um, is to kind of shift a little bit um, to kind of looking at some of the more direct uh, druidic threads in how psychology uh, taken from the mind of the, Ju the druid. Um, so these passages that I will read, and if you, if you take up the book, um, they actually, for me, can serve as guides to reading how. Um, and they're kind of like keys, and they, they unlock the druid in how psychology. Um, and But most importantly for me, because I too see myself primarily as a healer, as a therapist, they can also unlock uh, the druidry in you or the druid in you, um, your own inner druid, if you will. Um, so before you listen to me read them, you can kind of ask yourself um, as to what type of clothing that you wear. How does your clothing reveal or conceal your own spiritual nature? Um, and here you think of your, your clothing as not just the clothes that you wear, but how you live your life, how you speak, how you are with your family, your friends, your coworkers, uh, your relationship with nature. Um, do, do you express your spiritual self when you are with your friends and family, when you're at work or school? Um, does your home or work environment facilitate or in, inhibit the expression of your spiritual self? Um, like how, and as was said with like the Sufi tradition, you can use your relationships, home environment, work environment, to express your connection with the source so that your relationships are inspired, uh, breathed into um, by Awen or by whatever name you would want to call it, um, the Holy Spirit, uh, Buddha nature, Tao, Kia, whatever it might be. So regardless of the name that you might be, might be giving to this source, is important to have knowledge and conversation with it, the source of inspiration, and allow it to express itself through you in everyday life, through the ways in which you love, you work, you play, you laugh, and even cry. Um, it is that which is present in everything, in your joys, your sufferings, whether revealed or concealed. Um, and to kind of paraphrase Alan Watts, it's oftentimes just a matter of getting out of your own way. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to end um, with some passages from the mind of the Druid. And in this section, I'm calling it How's uh, Druidry Denuded? And so you can get yourself into this space of receptivity just to be able to take in the words that I'm going to read into your heart. And so I'm going to begin by reading what Hal says about um, the word that, that you find throughout his writings. Um, so he writes, that which was originally beyond exploded an aspect of itself into what it had created by its own division from non-duality to duality, infinite into finite, eternal into time and space. The kingdom of heaven was ever present as I, once upon a time, in me. The next one. Different as Druids were in their attitude to life, they were also different in their attitude to death. Death was as much a part of life as life was of death, and both were equally noble as complements of one another. Next one. Every man for himself can only be to his destruction until we realize again, as once upon a time, the Druids knew that all were essentially one in our complex, infinite variety. Our, our dark faculties are at least as important as our light ones and capable of as much development. And I love this particular part right here. The truest seer is he who sees most in the dark. The other is always a dark stranger, unconscious to our conscious, and we therefore feel afraid of him. So we either deny or diminish him, denigrate or destroy him. 
The Druids lived in a state of single-mindedness, which is quite contrary to our condition of conflict and complexity. The world was one as they also were within themselves. The Druidic problem was the same as ours, to realize the presence of the infinite within the finite and to gain immortal life within the mortal. The answer was so simple, by death into life or by self-sacrifice. For Druids and their primitive psychology of once upon a time, the tree stood for the spiraling process of a continuum through which man's journey passed upwards and onwards on its endless way. We have to remember that the Druidic world was conceived as being all of one piece, and their work was designed to keep it so. It should be quite clear, however, that to live in terms of the continuum, which includes time and space, everyone, everything, and everywhere, must be a mystical experience, because by definition, this implies a relationship with the beyond. The Druid's training was not a knowledge, but an experience which is the only source of wisdom. Meditation is a state of mind, but it is nothing special. It is a way of life. There is nothing special about psychotherapy either. It is only a way of life. The role of the psychotherapist consulting room is to provide a temporary secure enclosure in which the patient's problems can be positively experienced as they gradually confront their own resistances to their undigested past by which they have been conditioned. And finally, we only need our new awakening to realize again the ancient truth, which has never changed and never will. The universe is one. As you pointed out, um, so throughout uh, the book, I do talk about that idea quite a bit. Um, this idea of, of duality and how um, duality kind of gets resolved by the presence of the third. Um, but you can also add at some point, um, you know, this idea of time, right, that kind of comes into play, which you could even say is sort of the, the presence of the fourth, right, you know, this idea of the fourth dimension. Um, so I kind of look at this, um, you know, dialectically in some way, right? And so, you know, this idea of um, the pairing of opposites, right? And um, like, I think the way that Howe takes this up um, as a psychotherapist um, is similar to the way in which Jung takes this up as a psychotherapist. And, you know, the way kind of Jung frames it, um, which I really like, so he talks about, you know, when you have um, therapist and client, right? Um, and it could be, you know, um, father and mother, mother and child, any kind of duality, any kind of pairing. But within the context of psychotherapy, right? So these apparent opposites, you know, that seemingly exist on separate sides of the continuum, um, one on the couch, one being on the chair, if you will, um, but Jung says, like, with effective psychotherapy, and I think this is the case of how, um, that it requires, like, the presence of both as, as seeming opposites that kind of come together and encounter one another. So that the resolution of any kind of duality um, is as a result of the encounter, right? And through direct experience. And so you have patient and you have therapist or analyst meeting one another into in this space of psychotherapy in this consulting room, right? And as a result of this, this meeting, as a result of this encounter, both of them actually leave changed. So the therapist emerges differently and the patient 
emerges differently. And to explain what this third is, is kind of like, you know, how talks about like the child, right? Um, but for, for me, and I think for him too, it's this mysterious other, right? Um, I mean, in psychotherapy, like the patient for me is always psyche, right? And so ba both patient and um, analyst or therapist are always dialoguing with and about psyche. It's this in-between space that ultimately matters. But when the two come together in this meaningful sort of way, the dualities come together, um, both of them leave changed. Um, there's something ha something that happens that results in this transmutation, this transformation um, that can even be like alchemical at times. And um, what gets produced and what gets created and what comes from these pairings is actually something quite beautiful, um, which neither patient um, or therapist can really explain. And effective psychotherapy. Um, so yeah, that that particular part of the book, right, um, was obviously toward the end um, when I wrote about like you know the three circles of manifestation um, and this kind of elemental view of psychology and kind of playing with the notion of uh, threes kind of quite a bit. Um, and so like really what that was to kind of show um, was that how psychology is profoundly metaphysical, right? Um, and so using um, different aspects um, from the Druidic tradition um, and kind of looking at how's work through those lenses, right? And obviously, um, you know, this idea of the third, um, you know, and even kind of looking at that in, for, in the form of like different forms of meditation, you know, different Druidic forms of meditation um, that um, John Michael Greer kind of talks about in his, his work as well. Um, but that, you know, when you look at sort of this, um, like the three circles of manifestation, um, and this the idea of uh, elemental psychology and this ontology of Awen um, that I described sort of later in the book, right? Um, it's this idea that foundational to how psychology and foundational to his psychotherapy is a metaphysics, right? And so we're looking at, in all of the diagrams that you see in that edited volume, um, you know, in that anthology, you know, you can see, you find those throughout Hal's writings, right? So if you look at the, the 13 books or so that he published, um, those diagrams are present there, um, these illustrations that are, that are beautifully put forward. But I think what he was trying to do with all of this, um, you know, kind of critiquing psychoanalysis at that time, which was really establishing itself as a system and almost as a dogma. Um, with its own doctrine, with its own in-group, with its own out-group, what you can kind of see in that is how that gets stripped of any kind of metaphysical underpinnings in some way and gets replaced by a Freudian metapsychology. So you kind of move from metaphysics to metapsychology. And so here Eric Graham Howe comes along, right? with this idea emphasizing sort of this triadic kind of nature of the cosmos, right? Just as the Druids did, um, the triadic nature of the psyche, right? And so in Druidry, obviously you see um, reference, references to threes kind of everywhere, right? And so what he was doing, and, and again, like I never lose sight um, that he was a healer through and through. He's, his primary concern was with the patient that came to him in the consulting room, right? And to the point where he even says, um, we must look at the world in some way as the way in which a patient is looking at the world who is seeking therapy, who is seeking psychotherapy. And I found that to be very profound in some way. And so, you know, kind of looking at his work as a way to restore 
sort of the metaphysical foundations of healing, of psychotherapy. And he did this in such a way and at such a time um, that really made him anathema, right? Um, he couldn't join really any psychoanalytic organization. And um, I mentioned in the book how he had this um, lunch with uh, Ernst Jones and who invited him um, to be a member of one of these organizations and um, how rejected that. You know, you could say like, well, at the time um, that psychoanalysis was being established as a, as a dogma, this would be akin to career suicide, right? Um, and so in doing something like that, like there's this man that remained faithful um, to what was inspiring him, you know? Um, and, and for me, it's this connection with, with Awen, this source that inspired his works. Um, and so like using Druidry as a way to restore a metaphysical foundation for psychotherapy, for me is kind of how I read his work. Um, and so the work that I even try to do today um, as a psychotherapist um, is geared towards that. You know, um, I'm not necessarily overt about what I do, obviously, but it is kind of to whether it's, you know, looking at the, the triadic um, heart of the cosmos, um, whatever system, you know, you might use, it's to point to the basis of healing as being something that is profoundly metaphysical, something that you can't explain entirely, something that you can't put into words, something that in many ways in good psychotherapy, you just get out of your own way and allow the source to flow through you. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, so in kind of looking at um, Howe's view of depression, right? And I, I spend an entire chapter kind of taking a look at that, um, you know, and sort of seeing it through the, the Buddhist lens in some way, right? And so as you mentioned, that was another major influence on, on Eric Graham Howe in his work, right? And so, you know, depression in this case, um, isn't necessarily a medical illness, right? It's not something that can be reduced to an imbalance of biochemicals in the brain, right? That certainly has a role to play in all of that, um, but Howe's approach to responding to depression as a healer is non-reductive in that regard. Um, it can't be reduced to um, organic matter, if you will. Um, so if we look at it through this Buddhist lens, right, so there's this idea that depression is as a result to the way in which one relates to what is real, right, to what is reality. So it's not just, you know, um, inherent to the self, right? So how does one take up the world in some way? Um, and how is, what is one's relationship to love, right? You know, in, in the classic psychoanalytic terms, um, you know, uh, depression is like this idea of anger turned inward, right? It's anger turned inward toward the self. And how, of course, was very influenced by Freud, right? And his whole um, getting into psych psychiatry um, was inspired um, by reading Freud, actually. Um, so Freud kind of served as an original uh, impetus for that. Um, so kind of looking at it through this Buddhist lens, um, you know, what happens, you know, when we become attached to things, you know, when we become, uh, when we cling to a certain perspective or view of reality or a certain view of the self, um, that take, that doesn't take into account that things are impermanent, you know, that things are plucked, uh, subject to change, right? And what does this this ultimately produce. Um, and so looking at his metapsychology, the idea here would be, and it exists even today in terms of the way like I would take up depression in my own practice. It's, you know, it's as a result of, of being in some way um, disconnected 
or alienated from one's fundamental, one's authentic or spiritual self. So when the symptom presents itself, it's not something to be cured, right? If this is depression or anxiety, it's almost like an angel or a messenger, to translate that word directly, that's sending a message to you. It's calling you to, towards something. So like in depression, um, the world shows up in ways that it wouldn't show up when someone's not depressed, right? So looking at it from an existential phenomenological point of view, one's mood causes certain aspects of the world to both reveal and conceal itself, right? So, so when one becomes depressed, kind of looking at it from the perspective of healing, right, rather than curing, so you don't cure or eliminate the depression, you don't get rid of it, right, even though that's exactly what the patient wants, and we certainly understand that, because there's tremendous pain, there's tremendous suffering there, but kind of looking at how's kind of indirect way, you know, which comes from like Taoism in many ways, the idea is to kind of move with that energy, that flow of energy, and be curious as to where it might be going, right? And so the notion is like, if we can listen to the depression, to what it's inviting us to do, what it's inviting us to look at, what ends up happening is it ceases to be a symptom, right? And so like uh, the archetypal psychologist, um, James Hillman, um, who I absolutely love in this regard, says, um, when you can have your patient begin to sing their symptoms, they cease to be symptoms, but become song. So oftentimes in the consulting room, it's about like relanguaging the experience, oftentimes um, to one that is more poetic and more soulful in nature. And that transforms the relationship to depression. So how was big on this idea of, of relationship? So how does one relate to the world? How does one relate to oneself? How does one relate to the other? And so in this instance, by relanguaging the experience, one can have a transformative experience, um, which changes the way the person relates to the experience of depression as this lived experience. I um I would love to see um, some of his works uh, republished, uh, reprinted. Um, that is, you know, that's been sort of a, kind of a vision of mine for quite some time. Um, I really, as as popular as the mind of the druid could be um, for for an esoteric or an occult audience, um, for me, it's cure or heal. Um, which is, you know, if people are going to begin um, with Howe's writings, I mean, I, I, I certainly recommend that one if you can get your hands on it. Um, so, yeah, I would love to see his books republished, reprinted, um, to get them in the hands of uh, people that would have the opportunity to encounter him directly through his own words. Um, I feel blessed and fortunate to have all of his his works and I, and I was able to get them um, as used copies um, you know at a time um, when they weren't three hundred dollars you know for each copy um, they're, they're pretty beat up and they're pretty old uh, but nevertheless you know still very much readable um, but I would love to see how more widely read um, and that would of course um, be contingent upon his works being republished um, and because I am a psychologist and a psychotherapist, I really want to get his books, his writings um, in the hands of therapists, um, in the hands of psychologists, um, in the hands of analysts, um, so that they can read how the healer, right? And so, as I mentioned um, in my book, um, you know, his, his legacy you know, is as for me, a healer for the 21st century. Um, and I think his work is uh, rightly situated, um, even though he wrote it in the early 20th century, um, that his work and his ideas 
um, are, are prime um, for addressing uh, many of the problems and the conflicts and the divisions um, and the intrapsychic turmoil that people are experiencing uh, to this day. Um, but in saying that, like, kind of like with how, like, I don't, you know, I don't try to separate out um, like spirituality from psychotherapy, um, philosophy from psychotherapy and psychology. Um, you know, like how I do, I look, I look at all of these traditions and all of these works by these these brilliant um, thinkers and artists and, and philosophers as um, as ultimately alluding to paths of healing. Um, and um, encouraging people to take them up from those perspectives. Um, so yes, he was a mystic, he was a druid, um, you know, it was all of these different things. Um, but more than anything else, he was a healer. And he was a, a healer of the soul and um, offered a, a form of psychotherapy that is uh, rightly suited for our uh, current 21st century conflicts. Yeah, it's an invitation um, for people to dive into the work a little more deeply. So the goal was to, to pique people's curiosity, obviously enough to like, um, to kind of look at Hal's clothing, you know, that we see throughout the work and uh, dive into it and to really experience the work in such a way that is transformative for themselves. And that's important for me, that it's not just informational, but it's something that's evocative. Uh, sure, sure. I could talk briefly about those. Um, yeah, I guess in some way these are more of like the the heretical writings um, so that I that I'm putting out. So, being and non being, um, an occult experience, volume three um, should be out um, in a couple of months. Right there, you go. The third installment in that uh, series. It's uh, called uh, subtitled uh, Kenneth Grant and the, the vultures cry, um, and it's sort of a, a meditation on the wisdom of Shilba and outer gateways. Um, so I had a really good time doing that. Um, so yeah, so that that's coming out. Um, so I enjoyed doing that. Um, I used, in many ways, a different methodology in approaching that book. Um, I took um, Kenneth Grant's kind of method of dream control uh, dreaming while awake, and paired that with Martin Heidegger's uh, notion of meditative thinking as a way to actually write from that place in response to the wisdom. Um, so I had a good time with that. That was fun. Um, so that one, um, the, the, the final manuscript was just uh, approved. Um, so also, it's, I think it's out already, uh, The Torn Letters of Otherness, Volume One, um, which is a collaborative work with uh, Peter Hamilton Giles. Um, and so that was fun to do. Um, it's just kind of us going back and forth. And um, so that one's out. And, um, you know, I hope people will enjoy that one because um, there's this idea that in that book, we're, we're playing around with the notion. It's kind of like a phenomenology and grammatology of the idea of, of the thorn, you know? Um, and we play with the word thorn by, by spelling it differently. So thorn can be torn, right? So it's the idea is um, a kind of occultism that involves being torn by the thorn, right? And so a lot of my meditations in that book uh, are around that theme. Um, so I hope people enjoy that as well. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for attending.